Well, good morning. good morning. Some of you are still acting like you're zombies. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's great to see every one of you here. I just want to say thank you again for coming and taking the time to uh, come to the journey this morning. And if you are here for the first time, again, thanks for coming and taking a chance to and being in a place you've never been to before. And we really do hope that you enjoy it. And wherever you are at on your spiritual journey, we want you to know that you are so welcome here and we would love to have you back and get involved and, and find out more about who we are. And, and uh, there's a reason for you being here. There really is. I, I know that. I believe that. And so just want to encourage you to come check us out again. Well, this morning we continue with part three in our series called Jesus and the Zombie Slayers. There's a reason why I had you turn around and say you look good for a zombie. Uh, but if you missed part one or two, I invite you to uh, go online at our, our website, journeyboise.com, listen in, get caught up, and, and hope you enjoy them. But we've been looking at the fact that every person in this world, every person, no matter where they're from, what they do for a living, how old or young, what they believe, how often they brush their teeth, or what food gives them gas, it doesn't matter. Uh, every person has a zombie living inside of them. Okay? Every one of us, deep within the darkest corners of our hearts, some have little zombies, some have big zombies. Okay? We've got something that's just dead, that's living inside of us. How does that work? It's like, like a reanimated corpse, right? Like a zombie. And just like that, a reanimated corpse, this, this, this zombie is destructive. It's anti-good. It's anti-God. When it's hungry, it will stop at nothing till it gets what it wants. It's skilled in the art of sin. It's vicious. It's uncaring. It thinks filth. It talks filth. It influences our mind and desires to control our actions. It's rotten to the core of our being, and it is completely self-centered. And this inner zombie is something that we all have, no matter what uh, shape or size, and this zombie is something that needs to die, okay? It really does. So I have a question for you. How many of you here, either verbally in, or in your mind, have ever tried to make a deal with God? Okay, yeah, a whole bunch of us. Maybe, maybe you're here because you made a deal with God this week, you know? Uh, maybe it's something that you wanted or something that you deserved but really didn't want for it to happen to you, right? And so you're there, you're pleading, you're making a deal with God. You know, I remember the first time that I was ever pulled over by a cop. First time, and, you know, I was about 18 or so, just bought a new sporty looking car that could hang corners really well, and uh, I was out one night with a bunch of my friends down in a town called Pacifica, which is uh, just directly south of San Francisco, right along the coast, and I had some friends that lived there. It was dark, and I was following another friend who was driving his car in front of me because we were supposed to go bowling or something. I can't remember, but I, I didn't know where it was at. And so I'm following him. Well, he decides to try to lose me, okay? And so I decide to tailgate him and let him know that he can't lose me. There's just no stinking way, right? Uh, and so we are zipping up and down these hills and flying around sharp, sharp turns and just putting on full throttle as fast as we can, you know, through bends and through these neighborhoods, and all through neighborhoods. And, you know, I had friends with me in the car who were just having a blast. And, and as we're going along, all of a sudden, it was, you know, I looked in my rearview mirror and I see these colorful red and blue lights. And I'm thinking, <gasps> you know, and it snapped right in, back into reality. Is, is what happened to me, and, and oh my goodness, I freaked out, so I pulled over, and you remember, it was my first time getting pulled over, and I was scared, my ha heart was pounding in my chest, my hands were shaking, my face went pale, I mean, it was so pale, I probably could have started on twilight, all right, it was, it was just like that, and so, so the, the cop comes to my window, you know, with a flashlight that, you, that they could see through walls, I mean, the thing was so stinking bright, right, and he goes, do you realize you were going 62 in a 35 mile an hour zone? Maybe, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and so he asked for my driver's license, insurance, registration, and, you know, and he could see that I was, uh, my hands were shaking, my voice was trembling, and, and uh, while he was back at his car running my information, you know, into headquarters or whatever they, how they, they do it, I remember thinking, what if he gives me a ticket that I can't pay? What if, what, if, what if I get arrested because, you know, I was, you know, way going, you know, oh, my goodness, what if my insurance rates go up? What, what if my parents, oh, they're going to kill me. They're going to kill me, and then they're going to kick me to the curb if they find out about this, right? And, and I, I started pleading with God, God, I am so sorry for 
everything, you know? I mean, it was just like, and you name it, God, and I'm sorry for it. I, I'm sorry for speeding. I'm sorry for calling my brother a dork. I'm sorry for not supporting an orphan in China, you know? And I mean, I was just, just kind of going through the list. God, will you just please, if you get me out of this, I promise I will never speed again, <laughs> ever. I'll be nice to my brother. I'll go to church every Sunday, you know, right? And, and yeah, Stephanie knows that's not true. And so... So does my wife. And so the, the cop came back to me and he said, uh, Mr. Boswell, I really don't know why I'm doing this, but I've decided not to cite you, but to give you a warning this time. And I was like, thank you, officer. You know, just like, oh my goodness. And I said, I, I, I could hug you right now. He goes, please don't. And I said, I won't. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I was like, oh my goodness. He said, just be careful and uh, tell your friend that you were following to be careful as well. And I'm like, okay, I will. You know, I, I was blown away. I was so relieved. I, you know, still shaking. I was thanking God. He came through. He answered my prayer. Either he answered my prayer or the cop felt sorry for me. I think he answered my prayer. It was amazing. And as for the deal that I made with God, I did really, really good with that for the first couple of weeks. And then something happened inside me, right? So the zombie began to surface, life returned to normal, and I quickly forgot and no longer really cared about the promises that I had made to God on that night in the moment of panic and fear. Instead, I learned to make adjustments, to watch out for cops, to be a little more creative and casual in my speeding, right? Does, is it just me or, come on, you guys, you know, some, some of you are like, you know, you're, you're, you're like, I never go past 55, whatever, and okay, whatever. But anyway, so, so some of you can relate to me, you know, you just, just get better at it, you know, and, and though I went to church often, uh, it was really still on my own terms after that, too. Why did I do so well in the first few weeks? And then revert back to my old ways. Or actually just reinvent new ways of doing the old thing. Why would that happen? The reason is because making a deal with God or changing outward behavior does nothing about the zombie that's still alive inside. It does nothing. Most people who attempt to change their outward behavior without addressing the zombie end up failing at it and become nothing more than hypocrites. And so today, this world is filled with hypocrites. We have Christian hypocrites, atheist hypocrites, Buddhist hypocrites, Muslim hypocrites, celebrity hypocrites, media hypocrites, political hypocrites. They come in all shapes, forms, and sizes, right? They really do. And, and, and it's because trying to, to change our outward behavior without dealing with a zombie does no good. Maybe just for a little while it does, but not much. Now, I know that this series is difficult for some people to hear because we don't like to think that we have an inner zombie. We don't like to think about that. We don't like to believe that we're bad or that evil dwells in, within. We want to believe the opposite, that we're good. We're good people, you know, who just happen to make mistakes. And as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago when I started the series, there is goodness in every person on this planet, regardless of background or belief or where you're born or how fresh your breath is. It doesn't matter. It's part of God's image stamped upon you and me because we're a human being created in his image. So there is goodness. But it's the zombie inside that wants to pretend that he's not really there. And even, you know, in, even though living in denial feels good, it does nothing about the zombie except feed it. And so we live in a world full of people who believe they're good, but habitually and increasingly lie and cheat and extort and uh, steal and sleep around and rage and resist God and fall into substance abuse and kill. And we say, we're, we're good, right? Really? Okay. But it's not until the zombie is actively dealt with and an inner transformation takes place that real change begins to happen. So how do we deal with this zombie? How do we fight it? As we will see, God has something to say about this. And it's, I'm glad he does. But the title of the talk this morning is No More Zombie Brains. Okay? If you think like a zombie, 
You're going to live like a zombie. Plain and simple. To start it off, we're going to watch a clip from one of my all-time favorite movies called The Matrix. I remember the first time that this movie uh, came out, not knowing at all what the storyline was about, it tripped me out, man. It just really tripped me out. And so the gist of the movie is that all humanity is being held hostage in a virtual world of a gargantuan computer, okay? All humanity, except for a number of humans who have been freed from the Matrix. And so Neo, played by Keanu Reeves, has been freed from the Matrix and begins to realize that everything he's lived and believed was a lie. And so in this clip, Morpheus, who freed him, is trying to help rewire the way Neo thinks about life and reality and everything he sees. So let's go ahead and roll the clip from the Matrix. Faster than this. Don't think you are. Know you are. Come on, stop trying to hit me and hit me. I don't believe it. I know what you're trying to do. I'm trying to free your mind, Neo. But I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through it. Tank. Load the jump program. You have to let it all go, Neo. Fear, doubt, and disbelief. Free your mind. What if he makes it? No one's ever made the first jump. I know, I know. But what if he does? He won't. Come on. Right. No problem. Free my mind. Free my mind. No problem. Right. What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. Everybody falls the first time. Right, friend? Free your mind. (laughs) Um, Every time I I see that, I I think, well, maybe he'll make it this time. But but he just never does. Uh, You know, there's, I've got actually another uh, clip of a guy who was trying to free his mind. So let's let's roll that real quick. Yeah, so, so don't try that at home, okay? <laughs> and that wasn't me, but anyway, so, uh, <laughs> but in the Matrix, you know, Neo, his life is totally changed. His, his pursuits changed, his purpose changed, his life changed, and it wasn't only because he was freed from the Matrix, but also because he learned a new way of thinking. He freed his mind, but not just freed his mind, he was learning to renew his mind, the way he thought. Uh, if we can get the lights up above me, that'd be great so I can uh, see where I'm at. But um, here's, here's something that, that Scripture says. Paul said in the book of Romans, said this, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In another uh, translation, another version, it says, this, it says it this way. Do not change yourselves to be like the people of this world, but be changed within in a new way of thinking. Then you will be able to decide what God wants for you. You will, not, you will know what is good and pleasing to him and what is perfect. So uh, I invite you to, to take notes if you like in the green sheet in your handout. The, the first one here is, is stop thinking like a zombie. Stop thinking like a zombie. Okay? The mind is powerful. John Milton in Paradise Lost said this. He said, the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. 
The mind is powerful. What a person thinks about and how a person thinks uh, about those things determines who he is uh, and, and what a person does. What a person believes in his mind to be true and valuable and real determines the course of that person's life. And so this next point says this, a, a person is as he or she thinks. A person is as he or she thinks. Whether we like it or not, our thoughts are what govern our lives, right? Right? They really are. We live inside of our heads. We process everything that comes our way. And as we do, our mind makes decisions based on what's in there and what it chooses to believe. Someone said this, whatever you hold in your mind will tend to occur in your life. If you continue to believe as you always have believed, you will continue to act as you always have acted. If you continue to act as you always acted, you will continue to get what you've always gotten. And it's true. A very wise man named Solomon said this. It'll be on the screen. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. And if you believe Coke is it, or Snickers satisfies, or KFC is finger licking good, guess what? People will know where you find you, right? They really will. If you think life is about looking after yourself because nobody else will, Guess what kind of person you'll become? If you believe that it's okay to lie, if it gets you out of trouble, you'll become a liar. Just plain and simple. If you think your name is Neo, well, there are limits, okay? But there's this kind of funny story in the Old Testament book of Daniel that tells uh, of this time that this, this Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, went completely insane and believed himself to be a cow. And so he spent a number of, uh, it does, it's not specified how long, some people think as long as seven years, but a significant period of his life in the field eating grass, mooing, and pooping. That must have been a funny sight for, you know, imagine that. And how cool would it be to see that happen to our politicians in Washington, D.C.? Wouldn't that be cool? Out there on their suits, out in the, the mall, you know, the D.C. mall, eating grass and mooing and, and everything for, you know, Yeah, that'd be great. Anyway, but the mind is powerful, and the mind is also weak, okay? It's weak in the sense that it's easily influenced and deceived. Scripture says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. The writers of Scripture use the term, the world, often, to describe a system of beliefs, values, lifestyles, and patterns of thought that run contrary to God and his will and his design. The world is constantly trying to influence the way we think and subsequently mold us into its image through all sorts of means. In a very real way, it's, it's a network of thought. Uh, author Jeff Kinley, he said this. He goes, he said, the world, it's a mind filter through which we perceive and interpret life, reality, relationships, and morality. This filter distorts our views concerning sex, personal freedoms, money, authority, decision-making, family, parenting, dating, time management, cultural values, personal responsibility, and even theology. And he's 100% right. He really is. It's so true. We're so bombarded by the influence of this world that we often let it think for us And people often don't question it. It's kind of like an old sage uh, named Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, He said this. He'll say it in a second. A strong influence on the weak-minded. There you go. The force is a strong influence on the weak-minded. You know, that's, uh, he does his voice better than I can do his voice. That's the way we, we did that. But anyway, though it's not necessarily a conscious thing, We let educators, politicians, entertainers, news media, talk shows, marketers, uh, music, Hollywood, the internet, and so forth. We let them into our hearts, into our minds, our souls, and we let them in. And, uh, you know, as we feed on what they have to give us, and we feed on it all the time, and begin thinking like they do. And in so doing, our lives, whether it's in its entirety or in small little pieces here and there, Conform to the world's image and pattern. And the zombie loves it. The zombie absolutely loves it. And the results are devastating. You know, let's, let's, let's take the, the simple worldly way of thinking that there is no God or morality. Okay? 
and it's up to the individual. There is a direct connection between that and the record number of fatherless homes and the fact that one in three uh, girls are sexually abused in those homes. Uh, Sexually transmitted diseases are rampant. Drug and alcohol abuse is everywhere. Over 50 million babies have been aborted since 1972. If a person is what he or she thinks, and if we want to stop thinking like zombies, the next point is we got to stop quitting. We have to quit eating garbage. Okay, quit eating garbage. Now I'm very thankful that I have never had to literally eat out of a garbage can. I've eaten some very strange things, but have not had to eat out of garbage cans. I I've seen people eat from garbage cans. Uh, it breaks my heart. I never have. I'm very thankful for a wonderful wife who's an amazing cook. And, you know, tacos, enchiladas, lasagna, casseroles, baked fish, mashed potatoes, rump roast. She can do it all. You name it, she can cook it. It is so good. Except for the time recently when she tried a recipe for some gluten-free oatmeal pumpkin pancakes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can... Um, it, it, it went into the garbage, and nobody tried to get it out either, okay? <laughs> Wendy even threw hers into the garbage. So after, yeah, she threw it before I was even done with mine. I'm, I'm trying to be nice, and I'm thinking, wow, okay. Anyway, uh, I, I found this from, this is about 10 years ago, so it's, it's probably a little different right now. But America's diet, um, and, and, and so because of what we eat, because of what we eat, 220, this is every day, okay? Because of what we eat, 220,000 people will see the doctor because of a stomach ailment. 80 million aspirins will be taken every day in America because of what we eat. 1.6 billion over-the-counter pain relievers are dispensed every day. 4,000 people will suffer from heart attacks because of what we eat. 2 million will experience some kind of heartburn. To help the food stay in, $1.9 million will be spent spent on and acids, and $1.4 million will be spent on laxatives to help the food get out. It's amazing what, you know, but we are what we eat, and, and the same thing goes with our mind. We eat zombie food, and we behave like zombies. I was speaking with a pastor here in Boise uh, just this last week, and in conversation, he mentioned something I had no idea about. But he said this, he said that their church recently did a study of their community, the surrounding community. And and keep in mind that that this is Boise, not San Francisco or Seattle, okay? Within a three-mile radius of this man's church, there are over 700 registered sex offenders that reside within a three-mile radius of his church. 700. That number doesn't include the unregistered ones. And I can almost guarantee you that for every offender, none of them woke up that day and just happened to say, oh, I just think I'm going to go do it, do something and offend, okay? No, something leads up to it, right? Something leads up. It's a direct result of whatever they had been feeding on. It's a direct result. If a person looks at porn again and again and again and becomes addicted to porn, guess what that person thinks about when he or she isn't looking at porn? Okay? They're thinking about it. The images. Not only that, but the way he or she then looks at people has changed. No longer are they people to be valued, but they're objects either for pleasure or not. And so it changes the way a person looks at people. And it's only a matter of time before a person begins to act out the fantasies in his or her mind because the rush that porn provides no longer is there. And so they've crossed the line. And maybe porn isn't the issue for all of them. Maybe they were abused, and because they were abused at a young age, they don't think um, of themselves or others with value like they should. Because in their minds, people don't have value because they were treated with such low value. And so that is fed upon. 
and it's how they think and act it out. You know, I'm not trying to pick on or judge sex offenders here. Um, I merely mention them as an example of what happens when we feed on garbage day in and day out. Like with any sin or sinner, sex offenders can find mercy and grace and love and powerful forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And they can be cleansed from a guilty conscience as well. And it's powerful. And, and I pray for people like that who, who, who've, who've crossed that line. And I wholeheartedly believe that there is hope, but hope for change and a new life through Christ. But it doesn't come through behavior modification. And it doesn't come from having been punished by the law. Just as the story I told you with the deal I made with God, it's not about outward changes. Those things don't work. It's about a transformation within, and it starts with our mind. And what does our mind feed on? Daily, what's it feeding on? Because whatever we feed on, it's going to come out. It's going to come out one day or or another. The next next point, see, it's it's not about doing. It's about becoming. That's what all this is about. It's about slaying the zombie within so that I can become something new inside and out. And that, that process must include the long, intentional process of renewing your mind. No more thinking like zombies. No more zombie brains. We've we got to have something better here. When we become something different, we will naturally do what is in line with that new late nature inside. You know, animals are fun to watch. They, are, they really are. I've seen dogs and cats work their hardest to do things that humans do. Have you ever seen that? They, they do. Uh, they'll, they'll, use, they'll eat at the, the table. They'll use the toilet. Some of them will even flush the toilet. They even try to talk. You know, and they'll, they'll make these, these funny noises and sounds. And so they're trying to communicate. But no matter how hard they try, they will never be able to eat with a fork or use toilet paper or speak fluent English. They never will. Why? Because they're a dog or a cat. Their nature has not changed. It's not an issue of them trying hard to do it. They would need to have a new nature and no longer be a dog or a cat. They'd have to become human in order to do everything that humans do. You following? uh, You you change your nature and you you change your actions. Uh, Actions don't change your nature. And so this next point is start thinking like you're alive. Start thinking like you're alive. And you're better than the the, the stuff that we, we get involved in. Okay, or that we take in. And so replace lies that you've believed with truth to believe. Free your mind, Neo. Just as in the movie, the whole matrix was a lie. It was a made-up reality to enslave the human race. Most people believed and were enslaved to the system. They were helpless. Believing lies do the exact same thing. They enslave you into a system, a false sense of reality that's popular and thinks and, and feels, you know, good, you know. Um, it, it, it thinks for you and it feels for you when we take that in we become part of it. It may look good and feel good and taste good and appear to work for everybody, but it's still slavery. The zombie wins and it doesn't end well. And it doesn't deliver the life that it promises. A lie is still a lie, no matter how often it's told or how many people believe it. And a truth is still truth, whether you believe it or not. And this can be tough, because unless we know truth, lies can be difficult to identify, because we take in so much every day. And lies are often what we want to believe. Because A, either we've always believed it and we don't like to change. I really don't want to believe that there's that many, you know, whatever. I really don't want to believe that I'm this or that or that. Okay? We don't like to change. Or we want to believe the lie because it makes us feel good. I've been there. Or we want to believe the lie because it's just too hard to go against the flow. Against what everyone else is saying. You know, I recently got into a short discussion with uh, someone online uh, as we communicated about a tragedy. There was a news article, and we were kind of commenting, that had to do with teens and alcohol. And uh, one of the people online mentioned that it's just a given fact 
that teens are going to sneak out and find a place to drink and party. It's just a given fact that parents should just resign themselves, that no matter how good of a parent they are, it's going to happen. And that's, and that's a common thing that's believed in our culture. It's similar to the notion that parents should just expect that their teen's going to rebel uh, because, you know, all teens do. And really, those are flat-out lies, okay? They are lies. They are not truth at all. Okay? And I'm not, I'm not in denial here at all in, in any way, shape, or form. Sure, it may be common for teens to drink and rebel and be promiscuous, but to accept it as truth is to give in to a self-fulfilling prophecy that doesn't, that, um, doesn't have to become a reality. In fact, that lie comes from the fatalistic mentality that actually encourages mediocre or subpar parenting is what it does. Oh, well, you're just going to do it, so I'm just going to do my own thing. And it's like, you know what? Nuh-uh. It doesn't have to be that way at all. That's zombie. But if we identify the lie and replace it with the truth, that if I, as a parent, can win my teen's heart, though it may be work, and I can have a health, and it'd be hard. I can have a healthy relationship with my son or daughter and spare him or her and the family and me a whole lot of heartache. And we could actually enjoy life together. Imagine that. Enjoying your teenager. Right? Uh, you know, I mean, you might think a kick in the groin is more probable than enjoying your teen, but, you know, uh, that's, that's a lie. The truth is that a healthy relationship with teens not only can happen, but should happen. They really should. And among other cultural lies, there's, there's cultural lies with religious people. Christian or non-Christian, it doesn't matter. And the lie is that if if you do what's right and follow God's rules and be good, then God will be pleased with you. And so we have churches and families and workplaces full of people trying to live religious lives and follow the rules that get thrown at them. They'll even make up the you know rules themselves for themselves or other people if they don't feel like they have enough. Okay, and that happens a lot. In fact, when I was attending Bible college down in Santa Cruz, some of you have heard this story, but, but there are a lot of campus rules that the campus was, the campus was very serious about. Okay? You, gotta, you had to keep these rules. No rated R movies in the dorms. We just saw a clip from a rated R movie in your church. Anyway, so uh, no rated R movies in the dorms. No breaking curfew. In fact, they even had a guard station posted, you know, out in front of the campus uh, with a guard who was paid to keep track of students who broke curfew. One of those guards was my friends, and he did me up a few times. It was cool. Anyway, so uh, no alcohol, no cussing, and especially no dancing. And the going joke was, why doesn't Bethany, our college, allow students to have premarital sex? Because it might lead to dancing. All right, you know, I mean, that was, that was the, you know, they were so serious about these rules. Now, now, I get why the campus had rules and why our state and our country has laws. I get that. Um, I'm not down on that. And, and God has laid out moral standards uh, throughout Scripture. And these moral standards matter. And they work for us if we follow them. They're unchanging. The problem is, and Scripture teaches this, is that keeping the rules can't produce holiness. Keeping the rules can't restrain the zombie or or change a person's mind or change a person's heart. You following that? They, they, They can't. I like how one person put it. He said this, Believing that obeying the commandments protects you from your sin nature is like building a fence in your backyard to keep your neighbor's air out. It's not only ineffective, it's stupid, okay? Being religious and trying to follow God's rules will either puff you up into a spiritual snob as you compare yourself uh, to other people who are not as good as you are, or it will cause a person to falsely think that they're right with God, or it will give someone a warped view that God as Father is never pleased with you, no matter how much you do you're still going to come up short, and he's just not going to be pleased. And so you're trying and trying and trying. And you'll either have, you know, you'll, you'll never have any real peace because you're never sure if God's really happy with you or not. 
But either scenario keeps a person from fully knowing and experiencing the tremendous life-changing love of God. See, when law is involved, love takes a back seat. And the truth is that laws and rules, even the Ten Commandments, they were, yes, they were, okay, they were never intended to save us or earn us brownie points with God. Instead, they were given to us, yes, to show us what's right, to reveal God's nature and character, and they were given to us to point out our sin, as well as what, you know, yeah, this is a standard that we need to try to, you know, shoot for. But ultimately, they were given to us to point us to the fact that we need a Savior. We need someone to save us because we can't do this on our own at all. See, Jesus had already pleased God for us when he was on the cross and cried out, it is finished. He meant that your debt to God and my debt to God were now paid in full. That's it, completely done. Nothing else is needed and understanding and believing that is freeing and it's renewing And for those who believe this truth and place their faith and trust in Christ, we then receive God's mercy and favor. And because of that, he's pleased with us. And there's nothing we can do to make God love us any more or any less. His love for us is perfect. And so following the rules and seeking to obey God isn't so that we'll somehow, you know, somehow that he will somehow accept us, but it's simply because we're already fully accepted by him. Fully accepted. And that knowledge, truly believing that changes things. Inside, we're free. Free to love him, free to live for him because of love. And these are just a couple of examples of replacing lies with truth. There's, I mean, we can, go, we can sit here all day and, and, and try to identify everything that's, that's, that's going through our lives. But how do I identify lies and truth? Because not everything in the world is a lie. Okay? Um, it's such a mixed bag that we live in. And so we easily take on the world's views, opinions, and feelings about issues of life. So how do we do that? First of all, next point, immerse yourself in the truth. Immerse yourself in truth. Before they come out with those counterfeit money pens that they mark up U.S. currency with, the way that a person was trained to identify counterfeit money was that they were immersed, they immersed them into studying the $100 bill. Inside and out and everything, they knew how to feel, they knew how to smell, they knew everything about it. They didn't study all the other counterfeit stuff. They just studied the real thing. So that when they come across something that's counterfeit, they can identify it because whatever is not, whatever's counterfeit, it's not going to be the real thing. They can notice it because they knew the truth. They knew how to identify what was false. And if we want to discern and renew our minds in truth and begin thinking like a person who is alive and free, we need to do the same thing. You know, it's funny how often I encounter people, especially online, who call themselves free thinkers because, well, they don't believe in God anymore. (laughs) When really, they don't think for themselves. They're just regurgitating someone else's ideas is what they're doing. Okay, no free thinking there. We need to immerse ourselves in truth. That's the reason why almost every Sunday you will hear me say that you need to read your Bible, okay? Develop a daily reading plan. Learn how to study this so it makes sense for you. Because woven through these pages are God's thoughts and feelings and views. And in God, there is nothing false whatsoever, nothing. If we want to renew our minds and replace our zombie worldview with a worldview that's truth, it starts here. It starts with this. And let truth then become your mind filter through which you perceive and interpret life and reality, relationships and morality. Let God's thoughts retrain the way we think about sex and personal freedoms and money and authority and decision making, family, parenting, dating, time management, cultural values, personal responsibility, and our understanding about God himself. Well, Mike, how do I know that the Bible really is truth? That's the biggest assumption, and you know what happens when people assume, right? It's actually not an assumption. The Bible has stood the test of time, and it awaits you to test it 
as well. It has. Truth can be tested, and it always holds, holds up scrutiny. Truth is its own defense. And truth be, can be tested empirically, philosophically, uh, scientifically, historically, but it's, it, it awaits your testing if you doubt it. And I encourage you to, to test it. But truth is that which affirms the nature of reality as it is, regardless of how we think or feel about it or want it to be. And if we want to slay the inner zombie and be transformed by the renewing of our minds, then we need to be willing to pay the price of whatever it costs that comes with saturating our minds and heart with truth. Even if it doesn't fit our desires, even if the truth hurts in the, in the moment, even if it's unpopular and doesn't taste good. Because truth, the truth is that lies will always let you down. But truth will always hold you up and give you a place to stand all the time. If you want to stop thinking like a zombie, you've got to start thinking like someone who's been set free, someone who's alive, be transformed. It starts with truth. A couple of last, last things as we close. Uh, a passage up on the, on the screen. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. It doesn't mean to be in de- denial about everything that's negative. It just means this is where to place your thoughts. This is, this is, if you want to be changed, this is what you need to do. Sure, you can look at reality. We all, I'll do that, Okay. But how do we filter it? Last point. Set your minds on eternity with God. Learn to see the bigger picture. Desire that thing. Desire things that are to come. Not things in this temporary life. And I know that's hard. You know, pursue those things that God has for us in eternity. Jesus talks about laying up treasures in heaven. Paul speaks of unspeakable rewards that await us with God. Start desiring those things which last forever rather than the things that will burn up. And let me tell you, I'm talking to myself in the mirror because I know what it is to live in this life and to want everything that my eyes see. You know, it is so easy, so easy. And that's why we're encouraged. Hey, look, look up, look beyond, see the bigger picture. Because as you do, you'll retrain your mind so that you can live live differently and live among the stuff that we're in every day and not fall prey to deception that's there and make stupid choices and continue to live like a zombie. Let's stand. Final passage on the the screen. Since then you have been seated or raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died And your life is now hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. No more zombie brains. Do everything, let's do everything we can to stop thinking like zombies. And we won't live like one. And so I just want to encourage you and challenge you to take an honest look at your life and your heart and thoughts and your worldview. What things aren't true? What lies have you fallen in love with? or believed, or maybe you don't love and you, you wish you could believe something else, but you don't know how. What are those things? Be willing to let those things go and replace them with truth. Set your minds on things above, immerse. And how much heartache can we save ourselves if we did that? And how much blessing can we be to other people if we do that? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. I thank you for um, your grace. And even as I I briefly mentioned, it's finished. And your pleasure that you take with us uh, isn't about how well we perform, but it's about our our faith in Jesus Christ and our relationship with you. Yes, you want the zombie in us to die, and you want us to put it to death. But that's a result of the fact that we stand so blamelessly in front of you. God, may we be changed by truth. Help us to to stop thinking like zombies. And I know we don't all think like zombies in the same way in every different thing. We all have different areas. But God, help us to renew our minds and to start thinking like people who are alive, people who have a new nature, 
those, those people who are in Christ. Um, may we be changed as we pursue this. So bless each person today. Help us to immerse ourselves in truth in the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks.